Hello, hello, hello. This is Marshall Goldsmith. Welcome to LinkedIn Live. Welcome to LinkedIn Live. And today we're going to be talking about entrepreneurial leadership in a time of crisis, a topic that has never been more important. We have two fantastic guests. And of course, my wonderful colleague, Sun Yen, is here. I'm going to briefly introduce myself and we will begin. My name is Marshall. I'm from Kentucky. I went to school in Indiana. got a PhD at UCLA. I was a college professor and a dean. Then for 43 years, I've wandered around the world speaking and teaching, been to 102 countries, 11 million frequent flyer miles just on American Airlines. I, I love speaking and teaching. I've been the coach of executives and of course, and many of the famous leaders in the world. Um, CEO of the year in the United States and number two CEO of the year and president of the World Bank and the New York Public Library and the Mayo Clinic and St. Jude's and just wonderful, wonderful human beings. And what I love coaching is that's where I learn so much from coaching. Although I'm supposed to teach them, they actually teach me far more than I ever teach them. And then I, I write books and articles. I've written or edited 41 books, including three New York Times bestsellers. So life is good. Life is good. And we're here today talking about entrepreneurship. And I'm with my wonderful, wonderful colleague, Sun Yen Xiang. Sun Yen, tell everybody who you are. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sun Yen Shang, and I help leaders and their organizations reimagine the future and be more resilient. I work with CEOs, uh, military generals, and also uh, tech founders. And I am the executive director at the Fuqua Coach K Center on Leadership and Ethics at Duke University. And currently, I am also the Thinkers 50 number one coach uh, receiving the award that is named after Marshall. Uh, today's topic is near and dear to my heart because I'm also the author of the launch book. And so I'm excited to hear what Alyssa and Eric um, have to share in their wisdom today. Back to you, Marshall. Thank you. Yeah, Sun Yun is a wonderful, wonderful person and very honored. Yeah, I used to be the number one coach, but now they put me in the Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame, that's where they put old people. So I'm now I'm now in the in the in the former number one coach and Sun Yen is now number one coach. And Sun Yen, I am honored to have you be my uh, honorary replacement in this award. So Sun Yen is wonderful. Now we've got a couple of wonderful guests. I forgot something else too. Uh, as I, I, I decided when I got older, I was going to adopt 15 people, teach them all I know. So I made a little video and put it on LinkedIn and said, my name is Marshall. I'm going to adopt 15 people, teach them all I know for free. And the only price is when you get old, you have to do the same thing. I thought maybe 100 people would apply. It turned out 18,000 people applied. And this group is called 100 Coaches, and they are just among the most spectacular people in the world. I'm so biased, of course, but I love the people in our group. And we have three of them here today. One is, of course, the wonderful Sun Yen. Sun Yen, I'm very proud to have you as an honorary daughter. And the other two are Eric and Alyssa. Now, let me introduce these two. I'm going to start with Alyssa. Alyssa is the number one startup coach in the world. She's been listed as a leader in startup coaching, both by Global Gurus and by Thinkers50. She's a contributor to Forbes. She does all kinds of work with entrepreneurs. And Alyssa, a member, member of our 100 Coach Group, thank you so much for joining us. And a parallel expert on this topic is my great friend, Eric Schoenberg. I've known Eric for many years. Eric, how many years have I known you? I don't even remember. God, 20 years, Marshall, I think. Uh, not to give away anything about our ages, but 20 years, easy. Yeah, we've known each other for a long time. Eric is a great friend and he's a wonderful human being. He's CEO of Inc. Magazine and Fast, and Fast Company and National Magazine Award winner, which is kind of the equivalent of the Oscars. And, you know, he's on the board of the Magazine Publishers Association. And both uh, Eric and Alyssa, in different ways, are experts on the topic of entrepreneurs. And there's never been, in my mind, a more important topic than this than today. Sonia. What's our first question for our wonderful friends, Eric and Alyssa? All right, so Eric, you run, you head up two publications that the top publications in the world that cater to entrepreneurs. I have entrepreneurial readership and Alyssa, you coach uh, startup founders. So what are both of you seeing in terms of the key challenges that entrepreneurs are facing today? Eric, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Alyssa. 
Okay. Well, I'd say that uh, entrepreneurs face three key challenges. Sonny, and by the way, thanks for that kind intro. Um, the first is just simply staying alive. And the key to staying alive is managing your cash. You can run out of profits, you can manage your sales, but if you, if you don't have the cash to meet your bills, that's what puts more entrepreneurs under than anything else. So manage your cash. The second thing you have to manage is your team. Think about what they're going through. This is an unprecedented public health crisis, a, a recession, the depth of which we have not yet plumbed. They're worried. They're concerned for their jobs. They're concerned for their family's future. And keeping them focused and keeping them upbeat is a real leadership challenge. And finally, the other thing you have to manage is yourself. You're also facing all that uncertainty. And if you're an entrepreneur, if you're the founder, that's your name on the door. And this crisis for you is positively existential. And so you need to just take care of yourself. Don't let your worries be shown to the team. Remember that uh, it's showtime every time you're in front of your team, that you have to keep them up. You're the leader, it's, respons you're, it's your responsibility now to keep the enterprise going. That's the most important thing. So managing your company's cash, your team's morale, and yourself. Alyssa, what are you seeing in your world? Well, I'm certainly seeing all of them. Eric has to say, and I just would add how important it is to manage your own psychology. So as you're going through all this crisis, there are ups and downs. There are naturally ups and downs when it comes to running a startup. This is a whole se second layer of ups and downs. So make sure that when you're doing decision making, you're not distracted by all the things around you and really focus on what are the key questions, what is true, and who do I need to be in this moment? to make a difference and to be able to positively impact my team. As Eric said, and I really agree, it's showtime every minute, and you need to showcase yourself as someone who is decisive and also transparent, who is optimistic, but also not Pollyanna. So being able to, to really have that, that, that right balance, that's how it really is important for you to show up as a leader right now. Hmm. You know, uh, Alyssa, uh, one of our friends, Bill Carrier, came up with a term I love that kind of relates to what you just talked about, called pragmatic optimism. And that is, you want to be an optimist on one hand. On the other hand, you can't be Pollyanna and hide from reality. It's tough out there. Now, speaking of which, I've got a question for both of you. These are very hard times. And sometimes leaders are going to have to make decisions that are not pleasant. I'm going to have to sacrifice some of the people here or ultimately, if I don't sacrifice the company, that's reality. You're going to have to make some very, very tough decisions. And in a small business, sometimes you really like these people. They're your friends. What advice do you have for people that are going to have to make these very, very hard decisions? And basically, you're going to have to get rid of people. And by the way, no matter how you cut it, you just can't keep people around. Eric, you, know, you don't have that much cash. The whole business will go under. In many ways, this can be like triage. Eric and Alyssa, let's start with Alyssa. What suggestions do you have psychologically to help people through this? And then Eric. Yeah, it's a very difficult uh, question. And it is a time, unfortunately, for hard truth and hard decisions. Eric? Eric, what do you think? The thing you have to remember is that the most important job you have, the one that will do the most good for the people you care about, including your employees, is to keep the company going. Maybe you can hire those people back if you've let them go. But the most important thing that you have to do, the dis responsibility that is on your shoulders and your shoulders alone, is to keep the company going. And you have to do what you have to do. People will understand that this is not your fault, that you're making a decision uh, with the greatest good for the greatest number in mind. And then when you have to let someone go, do it humanely, uh, do it with respect and let them know that it's just the situation uh, and nothing about them. 
Yeah, that's very good. Um, um, you know, Alyssa and Eric, one of the people in our group who you both met is Harry Kramer. And, you know, he was the CEO of Baxter, and he's had to make hard decisions. We both know our friend Alan Mulally. In his life, he maybe had to lay off 50,000 people. One of the greatest leaders I've ever met. Yet, he's in the airline business, the car business. It's tough sometimes. Harry said one thing I just love, Eric, that relates to what you're saying is, somebody asked him, how do you sleep at night when you have to do this? And he said, I always breathe and ask myself two questions. Did I do what I think was right at the time? And did I do my best? Is right, you do your best and you make peace. Uh, Alyssa, any other thoughts about this? Dealing with these tough decisions here during hard times? Well, as I said, um, the, I've been sitting in about 25 executive team meetings over the past month. And what I see is that people are being extremely careful. And what I would encourage everybody to do is to be very analytical in how you make decisions. Again, unfortunately, having to be dispassionate about it. And um, I, I think I would say that you want to also think about the greater good. The truth is that this, the saving the business is the really prime factor right now. And you want to do your best for all the employees who are able to make it to the other side and for the business sustainability as a whole. Okay, very good. Very good. Uh, let so me yeah, add something to that, okay. if I could. Uh, I have I've talked to Alyssa on this very question. She is such a great coach. And her wisdom was that, remember, you're saving hundreds of jobs by eliminating a few. And ultimately, that's the way to do the most good. You can hire the people back, perhaps, but focus on the fact that you're saving the enterprise, you're saving your life's work, and you're saving the jobs of everyone who remains. Right. Very good. Thank you. Sonia, and what's another great question for Eric and or Alyssa? Well, what I love about the last point is it helps people focus also look at the future, right? Look at the future and reimagine the type of company that this can be and to that this company is going to survive. So it's this mindset that we are going to survive. We're going to get through this, even though there's tough decisions that we have to make right now. Can we get tactical though, um, Eric? So one of the things you said earlier is to do to have those conversations with care and compassion and respect, can you talk us through some of the talking points? So say uh, one of the one, let's talk about how you talk with your employees about that. Um, because respect and compassion okay. can mean different things to different people. So I mean, I actually had uh, a couple of these conversations this weekend. So I can, I can tell you what I said. I focused the employee's mind, first of all, on all the accomplishments that they, that they achieved during their tenure at the company. Uh, and I praised them sincerely uh, for what they had done. And then I reminded them that all of those accomplishments, everything that they did cannot be taken away by the COVID crisis. And the fact that they were separated from the company does not diminish everything they accomplished to that point so far. And that those assets, those that record, that resume that they've spent their career assembling will do them good as they go out into the market. There are very few people I, I pointed out who had done as much as they had and that when this crisis was passed, they would um, be stronger uh, in the job market because of what they'd done. And then I, I pointed out to them that while there are probably not many uh, job openings right now and very little recruiting going on, they could use this time to achieve new skills, to uh, work on things that would make them even more attractive in the job market. So focus them on the future, make them proud of the past, uh, and let them know that they had my support as they went out into the market um, in, in search of their next gig. Oh, that's you know, so Eric, beautiful because Eric, showing help. Yeah, you know, Eric, I think you're making a good point. Let me just have a suggestion for many of the listeners. Maybe you're not an entrepreneur, but maybe your friend has just gotten fired, or maybe somebody you knew is going through hard times. And one of my good friends, Don Sherrod, always told me, always be so nice to people when they're on the bottom. 
everyone loves you when you're at the top. You know, money, you got a lot of friends hanging around the door. When it's gone and spending ends, they don't come around no more. You know, everybody loves you when you're at the top. You know, and Don's great lesson to me, which I've tried to implement in my life, is always be nice to people when they're down. Call them up, give them some encouragement. It can be kind of awkward or embarrassment, but you know what? That's what being a friend is. So I think, Eric, your advice is really good on the business perspective, but it's also good on a human perspective because it's kind of awkward and embarrassing to call our friends who are at the bottom. And they're the ones that need the help the most. So I think it's a really, really good point. Now, Alyssa, you're a coach. What advice, yeah. now, what advice is, you know, we had a lot of coaches on the call, a lot of people coach entrepreneurs. What's it been like to coach entrepreneurs today? And what suggestions do you have as a coach? Yeah. So thanks, Marshall. I just want to add one more thing about what Sun Yen said about future focus. So a lot of my clients are also thinking about the future. So it's having to manage for the current state and then also think about six, 12 months from now. And what I've been asking my entrepreneurs to think about and what they're in integrating into their meetings is what have we learned? What do we want to keep with us as we exit the crisis? that actually we've learned about our new ways of working or our new ways of treating each other. And what I, what I think they've found is that they've actually been very surprised at how well they're working together, how much able, they're able to communicate together, and also how sometimes in some cases faster things are getting done because they have less distraction. And, so, and also because a crisis really focuses their attention and galvanizes their purpose. So it's about really thinking about the shifts they have to make to move forward and then coming back to your question on the current state, Marshall, it's really about maintaining that focus. The most important thing is making sure that you keep the most important thing, the most important thing. So having everybody understand what are the main objectives, what are the most important things we have to really move forward on. And as a leader, constantly communicating, over communicating, communicating again, so people see you, that be visible in an environment where we're all remote, and they hear you and they understand what's on your mind and they can connect to you even though we're not all in the workplace right now. You know, excellent advice for leaders. How about some advice for coaches? One or two little some tidbits advice. for the coaches. Great. So in terms of with coaches, you know, all of us are doing, I'll speak for myself, I'm really being called to serve for my clients. So the best thing you can do as a coach is take care of yourself and make sure that you are in the right mental and emotional state to serve your clients. And I would add, you coaches, we coaches, we're all running a business too. So how do we need to get up to speed and focus our attention on, on shoring up the gaps in our own business? Marshall, you talked about, or Eric, actually, you talked about cash flow before. Coaches have the same issues with running their own business. So it's really twofold. It's about managing yourself to be the best you can be for your clients and managing your business at a very detailed level so that you can also emerge from this crisis stronger and continue to serve more people. Oh, I have one more. Actually, I have one more. I have one more. You, know, you, you tell me this, Marshall. I would say what I'm doing, what I would advise other coaches to do it too, is to use this moment to build your content, to write, to speak virtually like this, to make sure that you're posting on social media. Your message is important right now, and it's important for you to be able to, to raise that message above the above the noise right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Eric, great. you're a CEO. Eric, you're a CEO. And then, you know, Eric is the CEO. I know you're not trying to play God here. On the other hand, our whole philosophy is we just give people ideas. And again, as a good Buddhist, the uh, Buddha said, only do what I teach, it works for you. If it doesn't work for you, don't do it. So let it rip, Eric. Give a few ideas to CEOs. You're the coach now. You're not the CEO. You're coaching other CEOs. What ideas do you have for them? Well, one of the hardest things that I found in, in my role is controlling that fine line that Sun Yin and Alyssa both talked about of not being too downbeat being optimistic, but also not being Pollyanna-ish. I have an incredible urge to tell my team, it's all gonna be all right. And yet, I don't know that. Uh, what I can do is tell them what the truth is, um, what the plan is, why I think we'll succeed, um, but not 
offer assurances, and I would dearly love to offer them assurances that it would be all right, but let them know that to some extent, our fate is in the hands of forces that are bigger than us, but also to a large extent, our fate is in our own hands and what we achieve. And I think for every CEO, one good question to ask yourself is, what's your story gonna be at the end of this? What are you gonna tell yourself, your friends, your employees, other stakeholders you did during this crisis to make the company stronger, to emerge a better person and keep your team's cohesion throughout this crisis? So focus on what that story should be and then put in place the actions that will make it come true. Very good. All right, now I'll put both of you on the spot. Uh, Eric, you're gonna go first and then Alyssa. I love this idea of what's your story during this crisis. Sun Yen, was that bad or good? That was excellent. <laughs> excellent, we love it. In fact, it was so good, we're gonna practice it right now. Uh, I'm gonna be a good coach. I'm gonna start with you, Eric. Now, Eric, you don't have to tell me what is, this is what you would like to be. What is the story you would like to hear about how Eric managed this entire thing uh, 10 years from today? Write that story. All right, well, that's an easy one. I, I try to keep it in front of me every day. Uh, the story will say that Eric kept the team together that um, to use the uh, military term, that unit cohesion was strong, that everyone at Inc. and Fast Company pulled together and together got through the crisis. The second thing is that Inc. and Fast Company made the changes that they needed to make. A large part of our business, after all, is live events. And that business is at a complete standstill. And so we're figuring out how to bring those events um, to a digital audience in a virtual world. And that's a tremendous change and it's requiring uh, uh, efforts by everybody across many different teams. But I'd like to say that we made that happen. And then I'd like to say that we emerged stronger from this. And, and what I mean by that is that we did what we had to do to win market share for the few dollars that were out there left for sponsors, that we served our readers, the entrepreneurs, uh, and creative business leaders who read Inc. and Fast Company, and that they got a lot of value out of us and that they made the right decision in turning to us at this time of existential crisis for many of them by turning to the trusted brands of Inc. and Fast Company, and that paid off for them. So that would be the story. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great story. Thank you so much. Okay, how about... My coach, Alyssa. Alyssa, 10 years from today, we're going to take Eric's uh, story analogy. And by the way, both of you, I love these concepts. As I like two things. One, I think that most important concept from you, make what's most important, most important. And Eric, what story would you like to have written about you? I love both of these. I may publish them in the future, and I may or may not give you any credit at all for this. If I give you no credit, <laughs> it's just for the thing that <laughs> <laughs> so if you read about it in the future, say, God, and Marshall, where did you get that idea? I just remember I have a good heart, but a bad memory. So, you know, you may or may not get any credit for these ideas. I have them anyway. Marshall, I have been stealing, I've been stealing ideas from you for 20 years. So uh, you're entitled to a few from me. Get out. Okay, Alyssa, let's write a story about Alyssa 10 years from today. What's that story going to be? Is Coach Alyssa, give us the story. Great. So Marshall, like you, I am a Buddhist and I try to make these moments serve my awakening. So my story in 10 years is that all the trials and tribulations of this difficult time served the awakening of myself and I helped my clients see how it serves their awakening. And that is like not just pablum, that's like really true, that there are always gifts and sorrow. And that's one. And second, that I took this moment as, as a light. I was able to keep this moment light, even though it was kind of heavy. And then I was able to use all that energy to help my clients. You know, when I think about the work I do with my clients, a lot of it has to do with move forward faster. Even in crisis, there's opportunity to move forward faster. And I want the story to be that I supported them in doing things they did not know they could do 
during this difficult time. I would add that I want the story to be that I really was the friend everybody could needed and wanted at this time at the end of this in 10 years. That's my story. I'm sticking yeah, I, to it. I love that. That's a good I love that. <laughs> you, know, you know, Sonia, I'm going to improvise just one second. We have a minute or two left. What's that Sonia's story? That's Sonia's story of 10 years from today. Several things. One is that I help the leaders that I work with and my friends believe, believe in their sense of agency, believe that they can get through this. And because of that belief, uh, they're able to be braver and therefore they're able to chart a new trajectory going forward. That as a mom and a wife, that um, my family remained happy and safe and healthy during this time. And that all of us, through the reflection and the willingness to open up to one another, we learned and discovered something about ourselves and about each other that made each one of our worlds bigger. Yep. Thank Beautiful. You, thank you. Thank you. My story. Uh, 10 years from today, who knows, it'll be any me around to write the story, but my story is not to be written by me. My story would be written by the person listening right now or watching this little broadcast. Very simple little story. My desired story would be that whoever you are, you can write down a little note 10 years from today and say, you know what, that bald guy, Marshall Goldsmith, uh, made my life just a little better. That's about it. So if that happens, it's a fine, fine story for me. Final thing is, I just want to say thank you to Sun Yen, who's always wonderful. Thank you to Alyssa, and thank you to Eric for joining us. You know, I'm very honored to know both of you. And see you later, and thank you for joining us. And to our great, great viewers, thank you for tuning in. Hope you have a little better life based on what we're covering. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you, Marshall. Thank you, Sun Yen.